everyone. I'm Linda Nickel, and welcome to the Happiness Hour. Every Wednesday, photographers meet here to connect, inspire, and create. And if you'd like to join us live, you'll find the schedule for upcoming sessions on my website at lindanickel.com, as well as the links to previous sessions posted to the Happiness Hour YouTube channel. My guests share their photography tips and insight into their creative journeys, and they inspire us to look at a subject just a little differently. Tonight's guest is Don Wilson. Don is a full-time photographer and writer who shares stories of wildlife in high latitudes and high altitudes of the Rocky Mountains and Alaska. Her work in remote regions allows her to share wildlife stories and bring awareness about wildlife habitat conservation. Her work has been published in numerous magazines such as Outdoor Photographer, National Geographic Digital, Colorado Life, Motor Home, and Alaska Magazine, and that's just naming a few of them. Last March, Dawn published her book, 100 Things to Do in Estes Park Before You Die. She's also a team member of Wildside Nature Tours and leads in the field photography, photography workshops all over the world. Tonight's presentation, she's gonna share Land of the Polar Bears. In this visual presentation, Dawn shares stories and photographs from the Hudson Bay in Churchill, Manitoba. She'll talk about what to expect during a trip to Churchill, including wildlife of the area, travel tips, and more importantly, how to stay warm. If you're on Instagram, you can find Dawn at Dawn Wilson Photo, and you can connect with her through her website, dawnwilsonphotography.com. Welcome to the Happiness Hour, Dawn. No, thanks for having me. It's this was definitely a little bit of a last minute change. I do not if you guys know Lee, he has you know full beard, um, bald head. You're and much very different. <laughs> You're much um, prettier than Lee. And and cleaner, because I, I I spent several days with Lee and it was, was like we were ra we were raggedy by the end of it. So yeah, this is when you said you had to jump in the shower, I'm like, I don't bother. <laughs> Whatever you <laughs> Be better than what Lee and I looked like um, during our little trip. So thank you for jumping in and um, pinch hitting for him. So um, yeah, no, absolutely. I, Lee and I have actually traveled together, so I am familiar with. He is absolutely hysterical. He's a ton of fun. And when I I was telling um, I was telling Linda that I was, and I'll go through a little bit of what the last couple of days have looked like, but I had basically, I woke up from a nap and I had all these texts from Lee. Are you available? Are you available? Are you around? And I'm like, what do you need? I'm like, is this you? Like the, the urgency was somewhat unlike him. So I was thinking I was like being spammed or something. <laughs> He's, so no, it all worked please, out. So I'm happy to be money. here. What was that? I said, please send money to Cuba. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, so I am happy to be here and I'm happy to share some of my experiences of photographing polar bears. Um, I do love the cold. That being said, I am in Louisiana right now. So I'll talk a little bit about some of that. So why don't we kind of jump into all of this? Um, Linda's given a little bit of the background already. I did grow up in New Jersey, but I live in Colorado now. I've been out there since 2002. Um, I studied, I'm one of those few people that actually went to school, stayed in the same major, um, and I've been working in that industry ever since. I've studied, um, I have an MBA from Temple in Philadelphia, and I've studied a lot of different computer graphics and photography and other creative interests. But I've always had an interest in science and the outdoors and natural history. So this has been a great way for me to combine all that. I did spend 20 years in corporate marketing before I said, um, after a couple of really difficult years, personally, I decided that I just couldn't do the gray walls anymore and left that. And I've actually been doing this for, um, it's been over, this is my 11th year. Actually, last month it was 11 years. So somehow I have made it work and I'm really thrilled about that. So I do specialize in wildlife photography, but I do a lot of other photography. I've really been getting into astrophotography. I love the night skies. And with so many places going to reservation systems, I'm 
I'm really finding that some of those night night times I don't require the reservations and it's a little bit quieter out in some of the busy parks. Um, so we mentioned I published a book last year. And then for those that are familiar with Nampa, I was actually a, the president during I was president during COVID. So we had a, it was an interesting time um, to be president of the organization. But I'm thrilled at the opportunity to, that I had to do that. So a little bit, um, I do live near Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado, so I'm in northern Colorado. I have done a ton of traveling. I do have a goal of visiting all the wildlife refuges in the U.S., um, which is over 500 of them. Um, I'm only about a tenth of the way there, so I have plenty to do if I'm ever looking for some place to visit. And I am get, and I am working on a project to um, to celebrate Colorado's 150th anniversary about how things have changed in Colorado. Um, around the the growth of that state and how that's impacted wildlife out there. So so I'm always trying to find ways to talk about conservation and talk of you know use my writing, use my photography, and find ways to kind of package all of that together. And then a lot of people are can be it's getting a little bit long in the tooth now, but I did travel in an RV full time for 15 months as well, traveling the U.S. Um, we went all the way up from Alaska down to Louisiana, New Jersey to California. So we were all over the country. And that was an amazing experience. If you ever get the chance to do that, I highly, highly recommend it. This is a little bit about this is some of my work just to give you a little bit if you're not familiar with um, with my experience and who I am. I do a lot of writing. I do a lot of publishing, a lot of regional publications. I'm, I'm expanding more and more into some national publications, international even now. I've been doing some writing for some international websites. Um, so I, I like that. I like combining my photography and my writing into stories, into telling some of the natural history about some, you know, the animals, these really unique animals that we have out there these days. Well, they've always been out there. They've actually been out there a lot longer than us. So um, I mentioned I'm from Colorado, but I'm in Louisiana now. As many people did, we had this amazing eclipse on Monday. I was like many, many millions of people going to chase the eclipse. And I had been kind of pinpointing a couple of places in Texas, because as Linda mentioned, the, the blue bonnets are actually in peak bloom right now. And I had this vision of this beautiful scene at totality with blue bonnets and all I kept doing was looking at the forecast the the week prior and it was getting worse and worse and worse. So we actually at the last minute actually changed our plans and pretty much threw a dart into the middle of the area where there was this little bit of an opening in the weather in Missouri, in southeastern Missouri. We had no plans, no place to stay. Um, we had pretty much no idea what it was going to look like in the area. I had no completely unplanned and it worked out phenomenally. We had clear, pretty much clear skies. Um, the weather was really nice. We got in on Sunday afternoon and found a place to camp along the river, which is, I thought was going to be unheard of um, that late. So we, we got really, really lucky and just really thrilled with the whole experience. Um, so this was a photo for, of the um, one of the partial phases as the moon was actually approaching the sun. Um, to mention, I did, we did start looking at Texas, but so these were all in Missouri along the, um, these were in the Ozarks along current river. Uh, this is what it looked like at totality. So you can see it, it, it started looking like, you know, I would call this blue hour, I guess it was very similar to that. And then this is what it looked like at totality. So I just kind of wanted to throw some of these things in, um, for those that may not have had a chance to experience it. I know the weather didn't cooperate in many places. Um, like I said, I feel very, very lucky that what we wound up changing at the last minute. I will say it's been kind of interesting. We went through wicked weather in eastern Colorado um, and Kansas with winds like 90, 80, 90 mile an hour um, winds that were basically creating these sandstorms because um, a lot of the farmers had just tilled their 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 land um, so that all this dirt was blowing across the highway and it was crazy, crazy accidents. We saw 20 car pile up at one point. And um, so we had, we had that on one end and then today driving down to Louisiana, which my partner, he's from here. So we came down here afterwards. We're going to spend some time down here. Now um, we came through, I don't think it was the same storm system, but now we came through 80 mile an hour winds here, but with rain, they had eight to 12 inches of rain in this area today. So there's all kinds of flooding here. So 
So I'm, like I said, I'm very thankful we had some great weather when we were in Missouri, but we got bookended by crazy weather on either side. Louisiana is attractive to me um, from a bird photography perspective. I do a lot of bird photography down here, the brown pelicans, the white ibis. Um, this is Lake Pontchartrain. This is the causeway that goes across Lake Pontchartrain. So, um, you know, we we don't have these kinds of, we do it. We have a lot of big open skies in Colorado, but we don't have you know, huge, massive lakes like that. So that's what I'm doing down here is a, some photography along those lines. But tonight we're here to talk about polar bears. So um, polar bears are definitely one, you know, they're, they're one of the massive apex predators that are out there. Of all the animals I've been around, they are probably one of this and mountain lions are probably the only animals I would ever say I have a, a higher level of appreciation for the massiveness of these animals. They are um, curious. They are, they know they're an apex predator. They are not afraid of anything, um, but it's, it is mind blowing to act actually be near these animals. Um, so I've spent, the first time I photographed them was in 2013. Um, I've been, I would say probably every other year since then. So I've been to places about five or six times and I've been to a couple of different places um, to, to photograph these, these gorgeous, absolutely beautiful animals. But from wildlife photography and perspective, I, as I mentioned earlier, I have a lot of creative interests, but I have a lot of interest in science. One of the reasons I wound up in Colorado was I was actually looking at going to veterinary school. Um, so this has been a way for me to really find to, a way to combine all of those different things, all of those different interests that I have. I get to be in the outdoors. I get to observe animal behavior. I get to understand um, the science of animals or the science of weather and the science of geology, all these different things that really play a big part in wildlife photography. And the more that you can understand those things, I think the better your photos actually get too. Um, but the other thing is that as, as I mentioned in 2012 and 2013, I had, I actually, I lost a partner and I lost my father within three months of each other. And my mom was sick at the same time. And it was a very, very difficult time personally. And I really had to take a step back and, and look deep into my own interests and say, what is it that's making me happy? And like I said, that was why I left corporate America. I loved what I did. I just didn't, I never seemed to find any satisfaction with what I was doing or where I was. So I pursued my own passions. Um, but I also took a look at, you know, all the different types of photography I was trying to do at that time. And I was finding, I really wasn't mastering any of them. I wasn't really, becoming really, really good at any particular one because I was trying to do too much. So I took a step back and said, this is what I want to do. It's the wildlife that really I'm really, really passionate about. It's the wildlife that I can sit there and watch animals all day long. I can just sit in the outdoors. That makes me happy. And I have found a way to make a living doing that as well. So I do enjoy telling the stories of these animals. Um, I do enjoy the winter landscapes. I enjoy being out in the, in the colder temperatures than the hot. And yes, I do realize I'm in Louisiana right now, but the, um, the, the polar bears are just unbelievable. Arctic animals are amazing. So, so in 2013, one of the first things I did when, when I decided I was going to do this first um, full time was that I booked a polar bear trip. That was one of the first things I did um, I knew it's January, February, I started thinking that it was time to leave. I left my job in March. Um, I had given my notice and my last day was in March. And by October, I was up in a place called Kaktovik, Alaska, which is up on the Beaufort Sea, way up on the northern coast of Alaska. Um, it's about as far north as you can get. You can't, you actually, when you're up there, you're actually looking out just into ocean. Um, there's nothing farther north land wise from there. And it was an unbelievable experience. It is part of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Um, unfortunately, since COVID, they have not reopened it to tours. Uh, it, it's kind of disappointing. I hope that someday they do change that. But they, as they should, the Fish and Wildlife Service has been very, very protective of polar bears up there. And they felt that the tours might be, uh, you know, maybe a little bit more stressful on the, on the animals than they would like, like to see. So they've not allowed, they have not been giving out permits for tours since COVID. Um, it is still town. There's still an airport up there. You can still fly into there. 
you can still walk around town, but you can't take the boat tours that are kind of required to get out to see the polar bears because they, they kind of roam around out in the sandbars that are out just off offshore um, from the town of Kaktovik. But this is one of the cubs that we saw up there and they, they were just so, so much fun to see. And I was hooked. I was absolutely hooked. So the best place right now, in my opinion, to see polar bears is Churchill, Manitoba, Canada. So this is on the southwestern corner of um, the Hudson Bay. So this is the Hudson Bay um, up here in Canada. This little red dot here on the south south uh, western side of Hudson Bay is where Churchill is. It is only about 800 people. and There are only about 800 people that live in the town, but there's actually about a thousand polar bears in the area. So you could actually be in an area where there are more polar bears than there are people. So it's a it's a pretty remote location. Wapusk National Park is nearby. If you've ever seen the photographs of the mothers with the little tiny cubs coming out of the den, that's where they're photographed is in Wapusk. That's usually done in Feb like January to March is the time frame for that. Um, I usually go up there in the fall, the late fall. Um, there is only one main paved road in town and there are no roads that lead to Churchill. The only way that you can arrive is to either fly up there. There's one airline called Calm Air that flies into Churchill or you can take a train out of Winnipeg. Um, otherwise, that's that's it. So it is a remote town. This is what the town looks like. This is about 11 o'clock at night. Um, outside of the hotel, one of the hotels that I've stayed in over the years. So you can see it's, 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 a, I'll call it rustic, um, but it has everything you need. There are restaurants, there are, there's a grocery store there, there's gift shops. Um, this is the main road in town. They do keep the lights on like this because polar bears do roam through the town. Um, they do have a, um, they have a patrol that comes through town that's a group of volunteers that basically will kind of keep an eye and make sure that polar bears aren't there, but they stop at 10 o'clock at night. And that was why I took this at 11 o'clock at night to give you an idea of what they, um, what this place looks like when it's dark and there's no, no more patrols out there. Um, I talked already about flying into Winnipeg. There are about, there are two flights from many places. Winnipeg is pretty easy to get into. I know from Denver, I can fly straight up, up there. Um, and then you take a flight from Winnipeg to get into Churchill. We usually stay in Winnipeg when I take a group up there. I do um, guiding up in this area. When I take a group, we stay in Winnipeg for the night and then we fly to Churchill the next morning. The other option is to take um, take the train. So you fly into Winnipeg, stay overnight, and then take the train up to Churchill. But that's at least two days to take the train just one way. So it is much, much quicker, even though it still takes two days to get from wherever you live into Churchill by plane, it takes you probably closer to three days to get up there if you take the train. And then you have to do it all the way on the, on the way back. Um, Tim Hortons, if you like Starbucks, Tim Hortons is Canada's version of, of Starbucks or maybe Starbucks is the US version of Tim Hortons, depending upon your perspective on it, I guess. Um, so Canada is pretty easy to, to travel into. You do need a passport to go up there. Um, but otherwise, you don't need anything like a visa or anything along those lines. You want to keep the documents on your phone and always have a print copy with you at all times, which is the same for any foreign country. You should always have that with you. And you want to make sure that your passport doesn't expire within six months. Um, U.S. money is accepted in Churchill, so that makes it really easy. You will get Canadian money in, in, um, in change, and you can always exchange it. Just like any other foreign country, it's, it's pretty simple that way. There is an ATM in town as well. This is the flight from Calm Air that arrives into the Churchill Airport. So like I mentioned, um, polar bear season up there, and I'm going to talk more specifically about polar bear timing. Um, but we come, we arrive either in late October or early, early to mid-November is, is typical polar bear season. And it is already snowing and getting cold up there. Um, it's not bitter cold, um, but it, it does start to snow at that time of year. So this is what the planes look like. They're, I mean, they're decent sized planes. These aren't little puddle jumpers. So it's, it's a pretty comfortable flight into Churchill. You get into the airport and, you know, right away you are being reminded that this is polar bear country. You have a chance. I have never seen it happen in Churchill, but when we landed in Kaktovik, Alaska, we did actually have a polar bear on the runway. 
um, as we are taxiing out. So, I mean, that's just how remote some of these places are, which I love. I love these remote kinds of places. Um, but you are reminded that right away, you are reminded that it is polar bear country. So it's just some tips to consider once you are there. And then once you are in Churchill, it's not just polar bears that we're looking for, but we look for a lot of the other wildlife that's in the general area. Um, polar bears are definitely the target animal. Um, that's the thing that we will always stop for when we are out in the field. But red fox and arctic fox are, are common up there. Um, the arctic fox are actually getting less common and the red fox are getting more common. And that's actually another sign of climate change. Um, as the temperatures have continued to rise in the arctic, and this is considered subarctic actually in Churchill, um, the red fox are actually moving farther and farther north, and they're a much larger and a much more aggressive fox than the arctic fox. So it's actually kind of displacing some of the arctic fox, but they are in the area, um, and there have been times that we have seen those. Um, snowshoe hares and arctic hares, we have seen both of those very frequently. Willow ptarmigan are all over the place. That's what this bird is up here in the upper right-hand corner. Um, we see snowy owls on occasions. We've seen jeer falcons. I've seen snow buntings, common eiders. And that all depends on how quickly the water is freezing. Most of the Arctic birds will stay as long as they can before. Um, and then once that water freezes and once the snow arrives, that's when they start. Um, they'll actually start heading south, but otherwise they are still in the area. So this is an idea. There's a couple of different ways that people go out to see polar bears in Churchill. Most people, I think, are really familiar with the tundra buggies, the real big vehicles that ride across the tundra. Um, the group that the guide company that I use in Churchill, we actually go out in SUVs. And that allows us a little bit of a different flexibility. The tundra buggies can go out onto the tundra, but they're limited to just the paths that are designated for the buggies, whereas the SUVs can pretty much go on any part of the road system and then we can actually stop and it just gives us a little bit more flexibility in that regard. So we do get out of the vehicle. This, these are a couple of people with my group back here. Um, you can see that this polar bear, this was a sub adult, um, just walked in front of, front of our vehicle. So this is the Hudson Bay back here. It's not quite, it's not freezing yet. Um, so that gives you a, a little bit of an idea of what the experience is like. This was a mother and her second season cub that we found one afternoon. They were kind of nestled up together, sleeping and um, just taking a nap. Um, this is another one, another mother and cub. That's most of what we see there. We don't see a lot of males. It's mostly mothers and cubs that have found that being around town is a little bit safer for their cubs. As with most bears, um, the males will actually kill the cubs of other males. Um, to put the females back into estrus. So the females tend to be a little bit protective, obviously, um, you know, any mother animal is protective of the young, but in particular with bears, they have to be extra careful around any males. So they t you tend to see more male um, females with, with their cubs in the area. This was a sub adult that was out on its own for the first time walking along the edge of Hudson Bay. You can see it's snowing a little bit lightly. There's not a ton of snow on the ground yet. The earlier you go in October, the less likely you have um, for any sort of blanket of snow. As you get into November, um, there's more opportunity to have snow on the ground. So there's, and there's a benefit on either side to, to go at different seasons. Um, this was actually that same bear that was in that photo with the vehicles. You can see he was, <laughs> the polar bears will do this. They'll actually, they'll walk along and they'll pretend like they're sniffing things, but they're always watching you. They're, like I said, they're very curious. Um, they're always just kind of like, what are you doing? Kind of inching in, seeing how close they can get before our guides really start, you know, kind of shooing them off. Um, that's what this, this guy was doing. These were a couple, we actually think this, this was a male and a female, which was somewhat unusual this time of year. We think they may have been siblings. Um, we don't know that for sure, but they, for a couple of days, actually played with each other. They would wrestle, then they'd snuggle up together and, and uh, take naps. Um, but we had a lot of fun photographing. You can see it's, you know, a lot of, you know, frost on the, the grasses and the falling snow. And it's, I love that white on white landscape with the, the white animal and the white snowy, snowy landscape. Again, polar bears, very, very curious animal. You can see this one was, you know, checking out different signs. They play with a lot of stuff. 
you know, the polar bears are basically in the area waiting for the water to freeze. They hunt all winter long um, on that ice. And then they come back onto the mainland once the ice starts to thaw in May and June. So they spend the winter out on the ice, but they come closer to the edge of the water in the fall so that they can, as soon as that ice is thick enough to allow them to go out and hunt their favorite food of seals, they're gone. So that's why the timing is really important. But what they do in town, what the bears will do once they're in the area of Churchill, and it's the same thing up in Kaktovik, is that they'll basically just kind of wait for the water to freeze. So they're doing all kinds of things. They get, you know, they get curious about um, signs and, you know, things they find, like that photo I showed earlier of a piece of driftwood. They just start playing with stuff. They are very, very playful animals. Um, this bear liked to play with the, this is an electrical line. You can see the, the telephone pole behind it. And it would play with this electrical line that had plastic coverings on it. And um, our local guide, he was telling me that he knows some guys, some folks that work at the utility company. And he, they said that they constantly have to replace these because the bears are always playing with them. But it reminded me of like a bear playing a bass or a cello instrument or something. It just kept kind of flinging flinging this plastic on this wire. Um, so there are a lot of animated scenes that you can get. We do get some really good close-ups and, you know, for, for nice portrait photos. This one is actually a male bear. You can see they have much more of that Roman nose. It's a younger bear because um, it, it's not very scarred up. The, the males tend to have wider ears um, where the female ears tend to be a little bit more up on the top of the head. But again, that white on white, I just absolutely love that scene. Um, a lot of the willows. So there's a lot of scrub willow or tundra willow out in this landscape. And that's where the bears will sleep during the day. So very often, you know, that's why you really can't venture off the road. We, we are pretty strict about making sure you stay near the vehicle. We don't want anybody to wander off into the willows because when they sleep down in these willows, you do not see them out there. And then all of a sudden they'll pop up. But it gives you this great opportunity for, you know, they'll shake that snow off if there's falling snow and you can get all this, this spray of snow coming off their fur. The thing about timing is that you can see how white and clean this bear is. When before the snow arrives, the bears have been out on land for the summer and they tend to be a little bit on the dirty side. Once that snow arrives, it cleans their fur up really nicely. So that's why I usually try to go real late into October or the first half of November. Once you get into the middle of November, the concern becomes if that water freezes, if they have a cold, hard freeze early in the season, the bears are going to be gone. So then you don't have um, a lot of photo opportunities with bears. There are other things to photograph, but you don't have a lot of photo opportunities. So there's really about a really good peak three week window um, to be in the Churchill area for polar bear photography. Um, this is what the ice looks like as it starts to form. It basically becomes the first phase is like a slush. It gets, they call it grease ice. It's thick, slushy, and it just makes, you know, the waves have this thick look to them. Um, and then as the, as the wind comes off um, Hudson Bay, it actually will, anything that has, has frozen into chunks of ice, it actually pushes it into the, into the, not the harbor, but it pushes it into the shoreline. So what happens is that this chunky ice starts to form. So you get this grease ice first, then the chunky ice gets pushed back and it starts to create these layers of ice that the bears can start to venture out on. Um, and a lot of times that's where you'll see them. They'll be out there sleeping, testing the ice. They'll start venturing out. The other thing is that as that happens, as you get farther into November and this happens more frequently, it gets wider and wider. And even though the bears can't go out onto the bay to hunt, they do venture farther and farther out as possible because they will start seeing seals in this chunky ice. Um, and when that happens, it gets a little bit harder too to photograph them because the, the distance is just that much farther out. Um, but I love photographing them. That's why I kept this photo. Again, I like to tell stories with my photos and I do package it together with, with text. Um, I keep these things big and wide. I like to show that scene. I like to show what these animals are doing, what it's like, where they're living. Um, and then and then talk about that. Talk about why this bear is kind of chilled out on the ice here. 
and um, yet there's all this chunky ice around it. One of the reasons that the bears like Churchill is that there's the Churchill River that comes into Hudson Bay. Um, it comes, you know, it, it's coming off the tundra. It's fresh water, and fresh water freezes before salt water. Hudson Bay is salt water. So as the temperatures drop, the winds come off Hudson Bay and push the, you know, everything towards Churchill River. So what's basically happening is that as the water freezes on the river and that chunky ice kind of starts to drift out into Hudson Bay, the winds are pushing all of that back. So it's one of the first places on Hudson Bay where the, the ice does form for the bears. So that's one of the reasons why they are in this area. Here's another photo of what that looks like. You can see the water back here on Hudson Bay is not frozen yet. It's that chunkiness. Yet it's thick enough here in the foreground for this bear to, to start venturing out on. But I, again, it's that vastness of what that scene looks like that I love to capture. This is an old shipwreck that's out in Hudson Bay. It was, um, the story is that it was actually owned by um, Onassis. I'm drawing a blank on his name. The, the the businessman that Jackie Kennedy married. Um, he owned this, it went aground. There's, it's hard to see here, this is all ice in here, but there's actually several holes on the bottom here and it's gone aground. But to give you an idea of the size of this, see this little polar bear down here? Um, it's this massive, massive ship out there. So in the summertime, it actually sits out in water. In the winter time, in fall and winter, there actually, ice actually forms around it and bears and people, um, can, can walk out to it. If you go up to Churchill in February or March, uh, Churchill is a phenomenal place to take photos of Northern Lights. This is one of the places that the tour companies will take you to. They'll take you out to the ship and they actually um, use it as a foreground subject with the Northern Lights above it, which is pretty cool. This is what the tundra buggies look like. Um, you know, a couple, and, and there, there are two ways to see polar bears. I have done the tundra buggies before. Um, there is a platform on the back of the tundra buggies where you can actually get outside and photograph polar bears. You can see everybody inside um, photographing from inside of the vehicle. It's just a different experience. Um, I personally am not a big fan of it because I feel like you're more, when the bears are close to you, you're gonna be looking down on them. It can be um, hot inside and then obviously it's cold outside. And that's not very good for your camera gear to take it in and out of the cold constantly. Um, so that's part of the reason why I'm a fan of the, the SUV vehicles. I just just like the flexibility of that. Um, there used to be, if you've ever seen a National Geographic or a BBC program where you've seen polar bears with huskies together, that was actually a private property um, unfortunately, the owner of that property passed away a few years ago, and the and the huskies are no longer out there. But this was some of the on my first trip to to Churchill in 2013. These were some of the the puppies that I got to play with. You have to know, I actually I I'm on my fifth husky right now, so I've had many many huskies over the years, um, and I just absolutely love the breed. So to find all these puppies, everybody was inside eating lunch, and I was outside playing with the puppies. Um, but yeah, they it, it's there are a lot of, of huskies still up in the area, um, but they, they were a lot of fun to play with. These are some of the other animals you can expect to see up there. This is an Arctic fox that was sleeping out on these Precambrian rocks. Um, the edge of Hudson Bay is lined with these beautiful black rocks. I mean, you can see a little bit of lichen in them. You can see there's a little bit of color, um, but for the most part, it creates this black and white scene when you start getting a lot of snow on it. It's absolutely beautiful especially when you have an animal kind of nestled into that, that landscape. Another image of an Arctic fox in town. Um, you know, they do come, you know, like a lot of fox are pretty comfortable living around people. This is one of the red fox out in the, those rocks around the edge of Hudson Bay. Um, you see all different color phases of fox up there. They have, um, you know, this would be called a cross fox. So the, the red fox, this is still a red fox, but it's called a cross fox cross phase where you get the red and the black. You can always tell the red fox because they have a white tip tail, even though the color might be a little bit different. Um, this is another traditional red fox coat or red coat color of a red fox pouncing as well. Um, and then this is what you call a silver tip 
So you get the the black fur, but with a lot of gray and, and silver tipped hairs. Um, you know, so the animals up there are just, I mean, I think they're, they're amazing, but they do a really good job of camouflaging themselves. This is an Arctic hare um, hiding out in those black rocks again. Uh, moose, we do see moose up there. We don't tend to get very good photos of them. They are still hunted in that area. So usually when we see them, they tend to be a little bit wary of being around people, but we did see about five or six on the last trip up there. Um, so you never know what might actually kind of cross paths with you. There's one road that we'd like to take that goes into the spruce forest to try to get just a different set of, um, potential scenery. It goes out to, a, out to the Churchill river, um, where you can get a, you know, a big wide open view. Well, sometimes you'll see willow ptarmigan out there and some other birds. Here are some eider ducks that were still in the area before the water froze. Uh, the willow tarm again, I mentioned these earlier. These guys are all over the place up there, and we can get some really interesting photos of these birds. The snowy owls, um, they do hunt up there. They do not stay up there all winter. So again, if you go in the beginning of the season, you have a better opportunity to see some of these other animals that migrate out. So the snow buntings, the eider ducks, the snow um, snowy owls, the jeer falcons, all of those animals, all those birds mostly will migrate out as the weather turns worse or kind of becomes more like winter. Um, so if you go in the earlier part of the, of the polar bear season, um, you have a better chance of seeing these other animals. And then I always on my tours always remind people, you know, it's not just about the wildlife. It's about the experience, too. So I always remind people, take the other photos as well. Either use a cell phone or keep a wide angle lens near you. Um, you know, maybe have a like a double um, double harness for carrying a couple different camera bodies, so that you can photograph some of the things that just remind you of what it's like to be in the area. You know, this is Canada. Photograph the 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 Canadian things, the maple leaf, the flags, those types of things. We don't very often see really pretty sunsets or sunrises up there because it is turning into winter. So we do tend to have a lot of cloudy skies. But when those skies do allow for some sunlight to come through, it can be absolutely gorgeous. Um, this was a sunset one evening. This is the Churchill River here. Um, this this band of, of flat color, purple color in here is the Churchill River. This is just the shallows where the there's water there, which is reflecting the color of the sunset. Um, but it is actually just kind of a flat area. And we were out there, we were like, please, a polar bear's got to walk through. A polar bear's going to walk through. And it never did. So I'm still hoping for a photo like this on one of these trips, um, you know, with a really pretty sunset with a polar bear walking through. But it's still a, a, a pretty scene. This is the polar bear holding facility. This is one of those big stories that people tend to be curious about in, in Churchill. Um, the polar bear holding facility is for what I'll term as naughty bears. If there is a bear that continues to keep coming into town, keeps um, just kind of causing problems, maybe getting in the trash or something, they will actually put them into this facility, this holding facility, and keep them there until the ice arrives, until that water freezes. And then they will actually um, sedate the bear. They take them out in a helicopter and they release them out in the ice so that they can go out and feed for the for the winter. Um, it's basically the idea is to train them that they don't want to be in this place. They don't want to be in the dark. They don't want to be you know held within it. Um, it seems to be working. Um, they don't they since they've implemented this and I'm going to say it's maybe 15 or 20 years since they started this. It's not too terribly long. Um, they have a lot lot fewer problems in town. The other thing that this does that I always remind people to, to photograph are, is this artwork that's found throughout Churchill. It's called the Seawalls Churchill Project, and it was started in 2017 for, the, um, for artists, mostly Canadian artists. Um, I think the goal is usually to have Manitoba artists, but they do have um, artists from all over Canada. Um, that come in and basically can pick a wall, any wall within the town and paint a mural on it. Um, there's some fascinating artwork. I mean, this was, um, so this was actually based on a photograph from one of the guides that I go out with up at Churchill. This, this mural is on an old um, 
facility, old factory that that was up there. You know, Manitoba still has a big grain industry. They're they're plains, so they you know corn and grain and that kind of thing is one of the industries that they have. So because the train ends terminates in Churchill, they'll bring a lot of that food up, and then they actually ship it out on on boats into the Hudson Bay, and then it'll go into places all over the world. But this is one of the buildings that's no longer in use. And the artist actually took, he said he had one can of black spray paint. And this is what he painted with one can of black spray paint. So I thought that I always like the story of this particular piece of art. Um, this is another mural. These are some old satellite dishes. Churchill has a big infrastructure, because, and I'll call it big, and that's a relative term in regards to what the size of Churchill um, but there's an airport there, there's a, you know, shipping, there's businesses, those kinds of things that are there because during World War II, um, they actually had a base there for the Canadian military. I think the U.S. actually used the facility, the area as well. Um, but these are old satellite dishes, what I would call a dish. I don't think that's the technical term for them. But I mean, so they're falling apart now, but they use the building for another one of those murals. Um, we typically stop there a lot. This is the SS Ithaca. That was the name of the boat that I couldn't remember. So this gives you an idea. This was a completely different year. Again, beginning in November, um, the water had not yet frozen. So you can see how the ship sits out in the water um, before the ice freezes. So it gives you a perspective on how much it can vary from, from visit to visit in, in each fall. One year, the water was freezing around it already. This, this particular year, it had not yet Um this is some of that grease ice that I was telling you about, this slushy just above the edge of the grass here. Um, that's that slushy water that starts to, to form. Um, you really see it with some of the waves. Again, some more of that grease ice. Um, you can see a little bit of a rainbow out there. But that's the edge of Hudson Bay. So that's what the bay looks like. And this is the beach along the edge. There are a lot of these inukshuks. Um, they are the... Oh, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the, the native culture that's up there, but they build these. Um, and there's one that's actually in the center of town. Again, if you go up to Churchill in the winter for Northern Lights photography, this becomes another one of the really cool foreground subjects with the Northern Lights above it. So that's something that we'll usually stop at to take some photographs of. We usually do a group photo there. And then just some things around town, you know, just the the, the culture of what's there, the native Canadian culture, um, the Inuits, that's the group that the locals, the, the Inuit people that are up there. I mean, they are still, there's a really neat museum there that has um, a lot of carvings that shows a lot of their, their history. Um, so we usually try to stop in there as well. Parks Canada has the, an office there, as I mentioned earlier, the, um, the park, so the provincial park is what they call them in Canada, which is equivalent to our national parks, um, has an office up there and they actually have guards that work around that office um, because the polar bears can actually roam around this edge of, so the, the Churchill River comes out over here on the left, comes into Hudson Bay um, and the polar bears will actually roam along that edge just below those rocks. So they actually keep patrol out there. And the guy that was there a couple of years ago was um, quite a ham. He was willing to, he just kept kind of showing off for, for different photos. So we had a lot of fun with him. Um, this is what the, you know, the temperatures get cold. It can be pretty cold in the morning. You know, a lot of frost, a lot of really interesting um, perspectives to capture what that cold feels like. And I love the, the juxtaposition of a beach chair. You know, you think of these Adirondack chairs as something that you sit sit in next to a lake or a beach in the summertime, um, you know, on a deck overlooking the shore somewhere or something. And now here they are covered in frost and ice and snow. We did see Northern Lights um, on the last trip that I had up there. It is not something that happens every year because the fall is kind of, kind of like the spring this time of year. The fall is that transition season of weather. So we tend to have more cloudy and stormy days than we have clear days. But we had one night where we just, we actually had a really good forecast. I had been keeping an eye on the weather. Um, I had been keeping an eye on the Northern Lights forecast. And sure enough, I went out about 10 o'clock at night and I saw that that starting, that dancing that starts in the sky when you start to see Northern Lights. And so we went out to photograph that. 
this is it was actually a it wasn't quite a full moon this is natural moonlight on the trees in the foreground um so that gives you an idea of you know, on a long exposure you can actually get enough light from the moon to make that scene look like it's you know almost kind of like midday but it illuminates those trees in the foreground and we do you know we we go through what it's like how to photograph the northern lights how to get the streaks how to blur things how to you know properly expose for all of that so we go through those things if we have that opportunity to photograph them so timing for a polar bear trip i mentioned it is based on a freeze up in hudson bay there is never any guarantee on when that will be um, the average date used to be around november 7th and due to climate change that is pushing the date back and making it a bit unpredictable it's also making it a little bit later um 2022 is closer to this date the grease ice started to form on november 11th 2021 so 2022 is more average 2021 it was actually um, a, at least a couple of weeks later with the water not even freezing until december 1st so you never really know um they will do tours into late November. But like I said, there's really no guarantee that the bears will still be in the area. So that's why I always recommend late October through the first half of November is your best season. Um, you wanna be there before the water freezes, but when the ground is covered with snow, um, first snow in 2021 was November 6, 2022 is late October. Again, climate change is really changing the predictability of that. Um, Churchill is a remote town that does make it a little bit more expensive and it is pretty much a no frills place where my group stays. We stay in two bed and breakfast, um, locations that we have usually to ourselves with just our group. So they're, they're small homes that have been converted into bed and breakfast or an Airbnb, if you want to refer to it that way. Um, the owners of the home make us a really nice breakfast every morning. They're comfortable. They're they're They've been remodeled. Um, so they're shared bathrooms, but they everybody um, there are two people per per bedroom. So it's it's super super comfortable. And then with a general community area, um, the locals are very very friendly, very helpful. Um, they love sharing you know the knowledge of the town. The restaurants are pretty good. They're you know they are a little bit on the pricey side for what they are. Um, I do always suggest buying some food and keeping it in your room for snacks and lunch and, you know, things to take with you out in the field. And then we go out as a group for, for dinner each evening. Um, we do stop in the first day we go into, um, we actually go into the grocery store, you know, to pick up some supplies along those lines. If you are planning a trip to Churchill or for any of these big, um, big trips that go out into a cold location, um, I always recommend bringing at least two at least two camera bodies. The cold can be a little bit rough on camera gear. So you want to have um, at least two in case something happens to one of the bodies. Cell phones are really great um, for video. This photo here of one of um, my group participants was taken with a cell phone when we were photographing that sunset shot that I showed you earlier. Um, you know, the cell phones these days take amazing photos and they're great for capturing just the experience. And I love doing video. I've done a lot more video since I picked up my, my latest iPhone. Um, camera bodies and gear should be weather resistant or weatherproof. I don't know if there's any true weatherproof camera gear, but, um, you know, at least weather resistant. Some of the higher end models will be that way because we will be out in snow and cold, um, you know, potential weather conditions. You want to bring the longest lens you can afford. Um, you know, we all, <laughs> me included, would all love to have the 600 F4 lenses, you know, brand new, um, you know, the best glass out there, but they are expensive. So there are a couple of different options that you can do. There are some great lenses these days that are a 150 to 600 from Tamron and Sigma. Um, that's one option if you don't want to spend a ton of money on the lens. You could also rent lenses. Uh, that's something else that I always recommend for people if they don't do a lot of wildlife photography or if they don't, um, you know, if they don't have a need for that long, you know, to to spend that kind of money, you can rent a lens and bring it with you for that that week, week and a half. Uh, just to give you an idea of the nearly fourteen thousand photos from Churchill that I've taken over the years, about eleven thousand of them were taken with a five hundred millimeter lens. And another 1,100 were taken with an 80 to 400. The balance of them were taken with um, with my 24 to 70. 
Other gear, you always want to have lots of memory cards for these big trips. If you're ever planning a big trip anywhere for the first time, I always tell people to budget about a thousand files a day. So whatever that card is that can get that, you know, a clean card to get at least a thousand photos on it in a raw file format. You always want to photograph in raw when you're out, out doing these types of, of trips. Um, you want to have at least a, a thousand, you want to budget about a thousand files a day. Um, the weight limit for carry-on luggage on the plane to Churchill is 20 pounds. Um, bringing a computer can be tough. There is the option of what they call valet. So what we do um, when we go up there is that we actually, you know, we have regular luggage is fine. You can, you know, there's the typical 50 pound weight limit because it is a regular jet. So they will take the 50 pound um, suitcases, but because it's a smaller jet, the overhead compartments are a little bit smaller. So what we do, especially with camera gear, is that we have, um, you can carry the camera gear out to the steps of the plane, and then they call it valet, where they will actually put it into the belly of the plane, but you bring it to them, they put it in the belly, and then they get it out, and it'll be there when you come step off the plane. So it never actually goes through the conveyor belt of for checked baggage. Um, so that's a pretty good option for them. You know, this is, you know, these spruce forests up in on the edge of Churchill, as I mentioned, Churchill is subarctic. So it's not complete tundra. There's actually, you're at the northern edge of the spruce forest, or the boreal forest, they call it. Um, and that's where a lot of these polar bears will, will sleep. And again, this is a photo. I mean, there's not a ton going on in this photograph with the, the trees, but I like to tell that story of what it's like, where these bears are. Um, I'm always looking for those types of scenes, scenes to capture. You do want to have lots of batteries because the cold does drain batteries pretty quickly um, when the temperatures drop. The waterproof color covers are really important for cameras and lenses. There are a lot of options out there these days. I use something um, from Lens Coat called a raincoat, which is basically a waterproof cover that has like a, an opening for your hand to access all your dials, but the, the whole camera and lens are actually covered. And then you always bring it anytime you go into the cold um, where you're going to have maybe your camera gear inside in the warm, um, you know, the warm heat indoors overnight, and then you go out into the cold in the morning, that change in temperature, that quick change in temperature can create condensation on the glass. And it'll take 20 to 30 minutes for that glass to acclimatize to the outside temperature. So what I always recommend for people is to carry a large plastic bag with them, like a large trash bag that you can cover your gear with when you transfer it. It actually helps acclimatize that and hold the temperature a little bit better on the gear so you can avoid that condensation buildup. Because once that is there, it's really difficult to get rid of it until that temperature of the glass and the, you know, the frame of the camera um, acclimatizes to the outside temperature and you won't be able to shoot until that clears up. Other gears, you want to have a tripod that has spikes on the bottom. So again, anytime you're photographing out in the, the snow, you know, like if you go to Yellowstone in winter, or go up to Zaxxon Bog in Minnesota in winter or something, you want to have tripods that have feet in the bottom, the little spiky feet, and that'll help prevent the tripod from, it'll actually kind of lock them into the snow. Make sure you have your chargers and power cords. Um, I almost almost forgot my charger when I was on my last trip with Wildside. I um, went back into my office and realized I had left the, the charger sitting on my desk. Um, make sure you have cleaning supplies. Cloths are especially helpful for that issue with the condensation. Um, yak tracks are some sort of other traction device for your feet. So I live in Colorado. I have a lot of this kind of stuff. I have the snowshoes and the yak tracks and the micro spikes. Yak tracks are a great option to just throw in your bag, have with you, because as we get in and out of the vehicles, um, if it, there hasn't been a lot of fresh snow, the roads can be a little bit icy. And it's just better to have that little bit of extra grip on your shoes than um, risk sliding around either for you, your safety or your camera gear. And then I use this backpack um, called the Think Tank Mind Shift Photocross. If you um, are ever interested in that, I do have discount codes for Think Tank bags um, for camera gear. But the this bag in particular, I really like because the bottom is um, has a like a rubber bottom on it and it's a sling bag. So I can unlatch this waist strap and it actually slings around right to the front. And I never have to take it off. 
one of the things that you, whenever you're out photographing bears, whether it's brown bears, um, brown bears, black bears, polar bears, you really want to make sure that you're not leaving things out in the field when they're when you're there because they get very, very curious. Um, they will take things if you've left them behind and start playing with them. The other thing is that you never want to create a situation where the bears have associated you with food. Um, so that's something that we're really, really protective of. So that's why I like that bag. Um, you know, staying warm is probably, probably the number one question I get about any type of cold weather photography, whether it's Yellowstone or Colorado or Minnesota, um, in the winter time, you know, feet, they get really, eat, really, they get cold pretty easily. I have, um, the, these are called muck boot Arctic. Um, I think they actually call them Arctic boot. Um, they have a real thick sole on the bottom that kind of gives you a nice pad set of, you know, a good couple of inches um, between the bottom of your foot and the snow. Um, a lot of people like these mucklucks. They actually think that they keep their feet really warm too. I've never tried them. I think they are very fashionable, absolutely adorable. Um, I know people that have used them. They say their feet stay super warm. They're grippy on the bottom. Um, and they pack down really easy. They're much, much easier because this all compacts down. So they don't take up anywhere near as much space in a suitcase as these boots do. So what I wind up doing is usually wearing these and then my feet get kind of hot in the plane. Um, so these are another option for that. You want to have a waterproof outer layer. This is the coat that I have for, um, for Churchill and other Arctic and real cold destinations. Um, I have discovered over the years, this is faux fur. But I have discovered over the years that anytime I go someplace cold in the wintertime, having that fur actually helps to block the wind and any, you know, like snow that snow or ice or sleet that might be blowing around. Um, and it is waterproof. And I always want to have something that's long enough that when I sit down, my bum doesn't get wet. That's the worst thing you want to have happen is have anything get wet. Warm socks that don't cut off circulation. Um, you want to make sure that things are socks aren't too thick. If you get socks that are too thick and when you put your boots on, it, it can cut circulation off. When that happens, your feet will actually get cold. Even though you think that you're doing a better job by you know kind of patting your feet, cutting that circulation off will actually make your feet colder. Um, hand warmers are super important. Double layered gloves. I have um, from the heat company a liner that I use. And then I buy, I go to someplace like Cabela's or the Bass Pro Shops and buy a hunter's glove. That's a, basically a flip top mitten, um, flip that top back. And now my fingers are still covered in a liner glove, but they're thin enough that I can maneuver the buttons and dials on my camera gear. So those, and then I put, I will actually put a hand warmer in between the two gloves for, for some extra warmth. Um, you want to have a warm hat. I, I like fleece. I cannot stand hats that are itchy on my forehead. And then a face covering. This buff is what I tend to use. It's um, the it's the polar reversible version. You can get them on Amazon, but they have a fleece lining on them versus just the regular buff. That's just a real thin, um, thin, thin piece of fabric. But the the buff polar version actually has that nice thick thick um, fleece inside. Weather, if you're going up to photograph polar bears, I would definitely expect it to be cold, but not bitterly cold. Um, even though it is fall, winter has definitely arrived in Churchill. The temperatures are usually in the upper 20s to low 30s. And because it's a damp climate, the temperature doesn't tend to vary too much um, over the course of the day. So that's pretty much about where we are, right about freezing. Um, winds are typically likely, like I said, you know, it's a changing season. The weather is changing. So that tends to bring in wind with it. Plus you're off the, the, the wide open water of Hudson Bay. So that tends to bring some, some weather with it or um, some wind with it as well. This is, you know, one of the things that I love about winter is that you get all this frosty landscape, you know, when it gets cold and there's dampness in the air, like there is in Churchill because the water hasn't frozen yet. Um, you get all this you get, um, you know, the frosted, the hoarfrost on the landscape. And I am an absolute sucker for backlight situations. You know, all these times where you get the sunlight behind an animal and it illuminate, you know, creates that rim light. Um, you see that rim light on the back of this polar bear. So I'm always looking for those types of situations. Um, and you do get that up there. This The sun does set, 
Um, you know, you, you saw that picture earlier of, you know, 11 o'clock at night. So it does get dark, um, but it doesn't, the sun never gets terribly high in the sky. Um, and this was a screenshot from one of the trips that I took and you can see, you know, the different temperatures, you know, we had two days where it was pretty cold, 12 and 10, and then it was you know, 24, you know, right around those, those mid twenties. Um, shooting snow is one of the challenges of being up there that time of year. As much as I love the white on white landscape, um, photographing through snow is a challenge. Um, you want to make sure that your camera is not focusing on the flakes that are falling in front of the camera. So because of that movement of those, those snowflakes, sometimes autofocus can be difficult to use for photographing the subject. Thankfully, polar bears are big and they have dark eyes on a white fur. So there's good contrast there for your camera to pick that up. So usually what I will do is back button focus. So I'm pre-focusing on the eye. Polar bears tend to not move around. I mean, they move, but they don't move around fast. They're not like a bird in flight or anything like that. So you can usually pre-focus on, on that eye and get a lock on that focus and then continue to track that eye. Um, and that usually is the best way to, to maintain that focus on the animal. If it's a really, really heavy snowstorm, manual focus is probably going to be the way you need to go. You can also do things like um, use a 3D setting. Um, some cameras have that. There are obviously a lot of options these days for um, animal tracking sensitivity on the autofocus systems and cameras and the mirrorless cameras. Um, if and like I said, the, the polar bears have really good contrast between the eye and the white fur. So that tends to work pretty well. Um, if it doesn't, you might want to change the sensitivity on that. You might want to change down to, to a smaller area of focus versus a wider area. The other big challenge of photographing snow in any situation, whether it's landscape or wildlife, is that our cameras want to get your your scene to 18% gray. If you remember the days of film photography, um, you know, we would shoot with a light meter and a gray card, and that was what you were trying to get. The, that was considered the proper exposure. But when you're photographing a white scene and you get to 18% gray, your whole scene winds up being gray. And what you really want is bright white snow. You don't want to blow it out. You still want to have detail in the snow, um, but you want to make sure that it's, it's bright and vibrant and, you know, a crisp white. So you actually have to overexpose your scene by a couple of stops. And that's something that we talk about when we're out in the field. So those are all of the tips and ideas and photographs. Um, I mean, I have you know tons more photographs to, to, I haven't even edited all my photos of the polar bears yet, but I do love being out with these bears. They are amazing animals. Like I said, they're very, very curious. They're playful. They're fun to photograph. Um, and it's just a really interesting landscape. This is one of the bears. He was sleeping in these willows and popped up out. Uh, I do always share this quote. If you've never followed David Duchemin, he is another Canadian. Um, we mentioned um, one earlier, but David Duchemin has a really interesting story. He um, that he's been sharing on, I think Instagram is the place where he's sharing it most frequently, but he, he's very, very inspirational. I would definitely take a look at his work, take a look at his story. Um, follow along with him but he has this quote the most compelling photographs you take begin with the things about which you are most passionate and most curious as I mentioned earlier I took a step back from when I was having my own difficult time in my life I took a step back and really asked myself what is it that I'm the most passionate about and there is no doubt about it it is wildlife photography and like I said I've started I do a lot of landscape photography it's just kind of natural when you live in Colorado um, and I do a lot of night photography. All of that is still very interesting to me, but it is the wildlife photography that I will just day in and day out pursue. And I do like sharing that, that knowledge and that enthusiasm too. So consider that with your own photography. Um, so that's everything I have for the presentation in regards to content. You know, if you are not familiar with my work, I do recommend signing up for my mailing list. I wish I could get more emails out, but when I do get an email out, it is chock full of information about different trips I've taken, or it's about, you know, different photo tips or upcoming photo contests or tips for photo contests. I try to get all kinds of stuff in there. Um, I have this ebook. It's called Preparing for the Next Shoot. It's, a, you know, tips about traveling for photography. I have a couple of other ebooks that I'll be working on this summer. Um, and then I have a calendar that comes out every year. 
And then as we mentioned earlier, I guide for wild side nature tours. That's the bulk of my tours are done through them. Um, my next one that I have coming up is this bald eagle um bald eagles in washington which is the first week of june if you want to photograph bald eagles and you you're love to photograph bald eagles or want to learn more about how to photograph bald eagles this is a great spot where we spend hours upon hours just photographing bald eagles and then we actually go over to the olympic national park to photograph some waterfalls and flowers as well um gnome in alaska this is in june 2023 it is timed with baby muskox which um, I am sure I am hearing everybody go, oh, they're so cute, but they are absolutely adorable. Um, but it's also a really good time for birds that have now migrated back up to Nome. Nome is Alaska. Um, it's up in Alaska, but it's also tundra. So we get these wide open spaces, these beautiful, beautiful spaces out in the tundra with the mountains surrounding it. A lot of wildlife um, in addition to birds and muskox. And it's actually timed for the longest day of the year. So we actually go out and photograph sunrise and sunset at the same time. It's a really cool experience. Um, Galapagos in September, I will be one of the co-leaders on this trip in the first week of September for this year. Um, next winter, if you are into winter photography, we are going back to Yellowstone in winter. I believe that's the, it's either the third or fourth week of January in 2025. Um, we had an unbelievable experience with wolves this year, a pack of wolves. Um, that we spent the whole day with, but we also um, see fox and we saw several martins this year and weasels, um, bison. We always see bison, um, lots of different animals in the wintertime. I lead a trip to Peru for bird photography. Um, that's the primary target there is, is birds. We usually see about 300 spe different species of birds while on a um, 10 day trip along the Amazon River in Peru. We have um, Birds and Monkeys of Belize, that's next March. Um, this is the trip that I lead with women in wildlife photography for Churchill. Well, this year sold out. Next year, we will have more, um, more, more another trip next year. Dexenbog, which is also with women in wildlife photography. So we go up there um, to photograph birds, boreal birds in the winter. Glacier National Park in August next year. And then I do private tours in Rocky Mountain National Park. So for wildlife landscapes, anything that you want to do up there, um, I do that. We mentioned the book earlier. Um, I would recommend joining NAMPA if that's not something you're not already in. Um, as a member, I would take a look at them. If you want to learn more about nature photography, we have our summit coming up next year in May in Tucson. That's a great place to be inspired. Um, Hunts is a great spot if you are looking to rent lenses or you need some camera gear. And then this is my contact information. So that's everything I, I have. I see we've lost a few people. So hopefully I provided some good information um, and wasn't too terribly long, but I'm happy to answer any questions. I see we have, um, so I've got do you have some questions? Yeah. I do. Yeah. Go ahead. If you don't mind take down your screen, I saw one question in there and it's from Kathy. Um, I think you said it, but I want you to come back if maybe I just, thought you said it. She was curious, what indigenous indigenous peoples live in Church Hill? Do you know? It's Inuit. Inuit. Okay. That's what, that's the word yep. I heard. And then I thought maybe that's not what she meant. Okay. Um, yep. it, it was flying through here. Um, I don't see any other questions and I'm not worried that you went long. Um, I don't know. I should have warned you. Um, we have like people from all the different time zones. So on the East coast, <laughs> Yeah, I get, I get it all the times. Like, please change the time. And um, it just doesn't work for the people on the West coast. So this was our happy medium, but that is one of the reasons that we stick this on YouTube so that um, people come back if they, if they get a scoot out. So um, gosh, Don, thank you so much. Um, I have, this is one of those trips that has been on my wish list for a long time. So you're just pushing it up a little higher and higher and higher. <laughs> And it was pretty high already. So um, I certainly, what I really liked and I wasn't expecting was how um, comprehensive your your stuff was. There was a word that, um, there. Um, I think he's called it grease ice. Is that right? Mm -hmm. What is that? Yeah. I've never so they heard call that. it 
grease ice. So it's um, it's kind of like a slushy. So if you think oh. of going to 7-Eleven and buying a slushy, think of the surface of the water like like a big slushy. That's basically what it, it it's like. I'm not sure why they call it grease ice because it's not greasy. It's okay. um, but it is. It's kind of a, a thick layer of slushy ice, and that's the first first phase of the water freezing. Okay. Well, um, that, that was a phrase that I'd never heard. And I thought, I, I just want to make sure <laughs> I should ask. <laughs> so Dawn, thank you so much. It was nice meeting you in, in for the turnaround time of like, you know, the panic that Lee had to, okay, Dawn can do it. I'm like, great. So I thought we pulled it off pretty well. So yeah. I so appreciate so Donna, it. Don is asking about the photo in the background. So I don't know if you can yeah. see that in my background. So that is, um, if you guys are familiar with uh, Grizzly 399 in Grand Teton, that's her. Um, and those were the four cubs that she had that were born in 2020. Um, and then they followed her around through the spring of 2023 before she kicked them out. Um, so it was amazing to see them. I only saw them twice. I saw them that May when the park reopened after being closed for COVID. And that was, um, they were coming down the road all together. And then I saw them actually not far from that, that location. I saw them about a week before she kicked them all out. So I saw them when they first came out and I saw them when they got kicked out. And, um, yeah, that's a pretty amazing story. And she's a pretty amazing bear. If you get a yes. chance to go up there and see her, she's, she's old. She's tw 26 or 27 now i think she's 26 um so i don't know how much longer she'll be around that's it's old for a wild um grizzly bear so she is but she's an amazing bear yeah she's she's given birth to just like 15 16 bears in the park or something it's a lot that's, that's a lot for for a bear so well don thank you very much thank you guys for hanging in there with us and i appreciate that you guys um stick around I'll get Lee Hoy back in here at some point. But next week, floral and botanical photographer Deborah Stevenson joins us to share her presentation, Discovering and Capturing the Hidden Beauty of Flowers and Other Botanicals. And until next time, go out and create something beautiful. And I hope that we see you again soon. Mm -hmm.